Welcome to my YouTube channel, Rick Surwitz Watercolor. At any time during the video, you can click on the icon in the lower right hand corner and subscribe to my channel. This is the narrated step by step tutorial for my painting, A Good Place to Be. The photograph on the right was a reference for my painting. It's a photograph I took while driving through some of the back roads about a half hour from my home. And when I take a picture like this, I just stop along the road and take a quick picture. But even though I'm doing it quickly, I still try to frame it up thinking about good composition when I take the picture. When you're doing a landscape painting that's comprised of land and sky, it's good to have the composition divided into two-thirds, one-third, either two-thirds sky, one-third land, or two-thirds land and one-third sky. And that's what I try to capture when I took my photograph, and I've carried that into my painting. If you look at this, you can see that the composition is about two-thirds sky and one-third land and trees. A couple of very subtle changes that I made that I'll discuss briefly in the painting process have to do with the sky and the field that's in the foreground. If you look at the field and look at the painting compared to the photograph, you'll notice on the photograph to the right that there's some plow lines in the field and they kind of go from the left to the right and go off the page. If you look at my painting, you can see I've slightly adjusted the angle on that. The very subtle suggestion of uh, plow lines in the field are angled more towards the complex there that's uh, in the lower right hand corner there in the middle ground. So what I wanted to do is use those plow lines to help lead the eye into that center of interest. And I did the similar thing in the sky. If you look at the photograph, it's a pretty uh, even blue sky all the way down with any clouds. And if you look at mine, I have just a little bit of a suggestion of some partly cloudiness. And if you look to the left, it's a little lighter, and there's a slight angle to where those clouds are and the blue is in them. And it's at an angle that helps, again, lead the viewer's eye towards that farm complex. Before I go any further, I'll discuss the colors that I used to accomplish this painting. Normally I use 8 to 10 colors, but in this one I actually use 12. So those colors are cerulean blue, royal blue, cobalt blue, raw umber, quinacridone burn orange, rose matter quinacridone, pyrrole red, raw sienna, sap green, hansa yellow, quinacridone gold, and quinacridone coral. This is the sketch that I did on a quarter sheet of 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. So it's 11 inches by 15 inches. And I've drawn my sketch with a, a uh, B pencil. And I've put in just enough detail to give me the information I need to uh, move through my painting process. I'm going to begin with a sky wash, and I'll be working wet and wet, but I want that area of wetness to be controlled. So I'm going to turn my board upside down. I want to preserve the white of the paper and some of the shapes that make up the farm structures. One way to do it would be to use a frisket or some masking fluid. However, in this painting I'm just going to use direct painting, so I'm going to cut around those shapes. And uh, I'm going to use two different things to help me control uh, where my paint goes, even though I'm working wet and wet. The paint's going to be very fluid. The first level of control is that I'm selectively applying clear water to my paper in the areas where I want the paint to be. And uh, the paint takes the path of least resistance, so it won't flow into those areas that the paper is still dry. The, uh, the, the second level of control I have is that I'm painting with gravity. My board's at about a 20 degree angle. so that paint, once I apply it into that wet area of the paper, it's going to start to flow down my board. It's going to come away from the edge where the tree lines are, where the buildings are, and it's going to travel down towards what is actually the top of my, my uh, composition because I have this turned upside down. And that's why I turned it upside down. So I have the uh, 
uh, strategic placement of moisture on my paper because of where I'm putting the clear water and I have gravity pulling it away from the areas that I want to preserve the white of the paper. So two levels of control there. I'm using a half inch brush and the, the tighter areas so I uh, can keep good control of where I'm placing the moisture and I can cut around some of these small shapes and then I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to uh, use a one inch flat brush so I'm going to use a larger brush here to coat the rest of the paper so I'm pretty much done with the half inch so here's the one inch and I have a little bit of uh, cerulean blue in that from mixing my paint. I mix my paint in advance of doing this so that it's ready when I when I wet the paper. So I'm just going to brush that down get the whole paper saturated. So if you were to see this at the right angle you would see this is very glossy. Um, you can see a little bit of that shine in the bottom right hand corner from the light. Uh, so the paint is or the paper is saturated and I'm going to come in with a, a fully loaded brush of pigment and uh, apply that wash. So here I'm working with cerulean blue and I'm just going to be careful where I apply that and it's going to flow out but it's going to stop in, right at the edge where the paper is dry. And you can see that gravity is pulling that paint down so it's coming away from those dry areas so it's not going to build up a big bead on top of those areas um, if it, like it would if the board were right side up so that's why I turned this upside down so I, I controlled where I wet the paper and then I turned my board upside down so that gravity is working in my favor by pulling away from the areas that I want to protect I'm working with my half inch wash brush to start with uh, because I want to be uh, more precise with the application of the paint and now I've switched back over to the one inch flat brush. So I'm loading that up with a very fluid mixture of cerulean blue. You can see how you get some nice granulation with cerulean blue. Uh, this is a 140 pound cold press so it has a little bit of texture to it. It doesn't have as much texture as a rough paper would um, but it's enough to help uh, the, uh, enhance the granulation from some of the, the pigments that are, that are paints that are heavier body. And I've come in there you can see to the top right with a warmer mixture. It's a mixture of some hands of yellow with a little bit of quinacridone and coral in it and it gives me just a touch of a warm sky uh, to the right and I wanted to have that feeling uh, of that little bit of a lighter warmer area uh, with the sun coming from that right side and, and shining in and the, the barn gets illuminated but it's not a, a, an intense uh, orange color at all and because I'm working wet and wet and I've applied those side by side there's a nice gradation from one into the other but it really doesn't interact enough to, to mix and doesn't start to create a, a, a very neutral kind of a gray tone at all uh, which could happen with mixing in the orange and the blue uh, and I'm coming back into my wash with a little heavier uh, pigmented mixture of the cerulean blue because I want that to be a, a little deeper blue uh, in particular at the top and on the left hand side there you can see that I'm taking my brush. I want to pick up that extra moisture that's around. I'm going to get a tissue here and wipe that. You need to be careful. Don't leave the, those beads of water around your board because inevitably you'll drag your hand through it onto your painting when you don't want to or if you dry with a hair dryer you'll blow those around and blow them right into your painting. I've dried this with a hair dryer and I've turned it right side up and I'm taking uh, a light mixture of uh, water it has a little bit of pigment in it but I'm uh, putting just the the suggestion of some diagonals there uh, t to help lead the eye into the kind of into the farm complex so I've put some water and some cerulean blue and I've taken this fine mist spray bottle and I've softened those edges but I want to create just a suggestion of a diagonal there that helps lead the eye 
towards uh, those farm structures. It's not much, it's just very subtle. I don't want to have any gaps between this guy and the tree line, so I'm going to bring that blue wash down a little bit farther. It won't matter because that tree line is going to be a much darker value. So I've thoroughly dried this and I've turned it upside down once again. And now I'm going to apply clear water. Again, I want to control the wash that I'm about to put down. I'll be working wet and wet, so I'm wetting the paper around some of the shapes that I want to preserve. And I'm going right over top of the first wash that I put down. Uh, normally you don't have too much trouble with it uh, going over top of it. Sometimes you can with some paints. Uh, cerulean blue, you might get a little run, a little backwash effect um, because it's such a thick granulated pigment. Um, you don't want to agitate too much, you just want to go over uh, gently with some water and then I'll be introducing some pigment into the, the area that I've um, put the moisture. And another area here that I want to preserve is there's a strip right uh, above the area that I'm painting that's going to be a, a bright green and gold tone. And I don't want to lose the pure white of the paper there because you'll get your most intense color uh, when you're applying paint to the pure white paper. Once you've glazed over it with something, if you go in with a, a bright color, it won't look so bright because you've lost that uh, the maximum reflection of light coming back through the paint. So now I'm going to be putting in the, the tree line here and I'm using combination of royal blue uh, quinacrid and burnt orange, a little raw umber, and just, even just a touch of some sap green. And um, I want to have a combination of some warm and cool feeling colors in here. I like that burnt orange, how it uh, mingles with the other paints, but leaves kind of a, a nice orange tone. And uh, the I'll have a bit of a hard edge right at the top there where the paper is dry and then I'm going to have that kind of a soft edge which will end up being the top of the tree line and that helps um, give the suggestion of distance with that softness and uh, lack of definition. Um, you know these are some of the things that you have to do early in your painting process they're hard to, hard to do later and this is where I feel that it gets what I call the the personality of watercolor. A lot of these kind of soft edges and, and flowing paint that, that's kind of mingling on the paper. It's, it's the beauty of watercolor. It's hard to get with other mediums, I feel. So you, you can't come in too late in your painting process and put in this nice flowing type of a wash with soft edges. At this point, I'm not trying to copy my photograph. What I've used my photograph for is to tell me that there's a tree line here and it's a relatively dark value and I'm going to keep it that way because there are times when I might alter that. But um, there's, it's the suggestion of the colors, the shape, the edges, the distance. There's a tree line here and it's in the distance and it's a, it's a fairly dark value. So, But I'm using some of the colors that I think would be interesting. I'm softening the edge where I want to soften the edge to create the feeling of distance. But uh, you can see I'm not sitting here with a little brush trying to copy every little branch and, and leaf that might be on a distant tree. There's some very tall trees that are closer than the ones in the tree line. And they, they go behind the, the building structures and a lot of the branches and and some of the mass of that tree, they don't have any leaves on them, but the branches, they're, they're, they're much higher up. And they're, they're very sparse because there's no leaves on the tree. But the, the branches, when they start to come together, they still touch, start to take on a shape and a bit of a texture. So I'm going to use the same type of approach here. Right now I'm working wet on dry. And, and I'm just going to come in and soften these edges with a spray bottle just to give uh, an indication that there's uh, these uh, collections of branches. They're not necessarily, you don't necessarily read as much individual branches as much as they, they read as a larger shape. So I just put a little bit of that 
mixture down. It's got a little royal blue, a little raw umber, but a lot of water. And then I, I soften that up with a spray. And then there's another tree that's a little closer and again, tall. Uh, so I'm going to give an indication of that. And later on in my painting process, I'll put some tree trunks and, and uh, some individual branches and some texture to suggest the tops of those trees. And now what started as wet and dry has quickly become working wet and wet. I applied the paint, I softened the edges of that spray bottle, now the paper is very wet and saturated. So now I'm going to put a few more drops of paint in there, a little, little darker value, not a dark value, but just a light medium value, middle value. And then blot that with a tissue just to give a little more substance to that. I have a similar thing going on here to the, to the left um, behind this, the, the, the barn and the silo. Uh, there's some trees that are behind there, some more of these tall trees. So I want to help give that indication. And by wetting the paper where I wanted the paint, I can keep uh, from losing that edge on the, the building and on the silo. I've thoroughly dried my paper and I've rotated my board back around. And now there's an area here where I preserved uh, the white of the paper. It's a band here that I want to put in kind of a bright green tone where the, the sun is catching that grass and it's it's a, a bright kind of a springy green and it's going to have some touches of gold in there. So I'm using hands of yellow with a little sap green for the really bright uh, tone and then I'm taking some quinacridin gold with a little sap green and just a little bit by itself to change it to some of that kind of a gold tone. And I'm painting around some of the areas where there's some uh, objects that are laying in front of these uh, farm structures. But I wanted to pre preserve the white of the paper there. It's obviously part of a bigger area of white, but um, this one strip, I wanted to put some bright tone down. Uh, and it's, it's going to be the most intense uh, color really in the composition and um, so that's going to help lead the viewer to this this where I want to be the center of interest that area is going to have some of my most intense color and it's also going to have my darkest values but I couldn't get this a nice clean uh, fresh green uh, by painting over top of another glaze I need to really to apply this over the white of the paper and that's why, uh, even though I'm uh, going to put a wash over this, I didn't want any of the other wash I was putting down to get it get in this area because I wanted to be able to put down this fresh, uh, bright green and, and gold tone. These colors are going to carry all the way over to the right side of the composition, even though they're going to be broken up in some areas by some other shapes and values and some things that are going on. Once again, I'm just painting small shapes of color and value. That's how I look at it. I don't look at it as I'm painting a, a thing. It's not a, a board or a... Um, I, I, there's things that I'm aware of what they are, but um, it to me it's, it's just a, a certain valued shape or a, a certain color intensity. I'm going to insert the reference photo in the top left corner there as I begin to work on the uh, plowed field here that makes up pretty much the uh, foreground. I'll be using a variety of mixtures that are made up with raw umber, uh, quinacridin rose matter, cerulean blue, a little bit of royal blue, and some quinacridin burnt orange. So I'll vary those mixtures. And this is a fairly light middle value that I'm applying right now. And you can see now that the paper is saturated after I put that wash down. It was dry when I first applied it, but now it's saturated, so I've gone from working wet on dry to working wet on wet. In here, I'm going to change uh, the angle of the, the plow lines here to help lead 
the viewer's eye more towards the the farm complex so I've, I've put this initial wash down and I'm taking some darker values and I'm going to let those diffuse a little bit into the initial wash so I'm using a one inch flat brush to do this and you can see if you look at the photograph there's a lot of texture there uh, there's all kinds of um, little clumps of dirt and I have no intention of trying to uh, to paint all those so I try and suggest that plowed field um, by uh, applying this this wet and wet application of of some different mixtures some a little warmer and some a little cooler and I just touch that into that and let it diffuse a little bit and um, I'll, I'll put a little bit of texture in there with some splatter uh, but I, I'm not trying to render this this field and, and as, as I said I'm trying to make some of these marks so that it helps lead the viewer more towards the center of interest of my composition. This area is also going to stay fairly soft edge because uh, I don't want to draw attention necessarily to this foreground. So it's going to be soft edge, it's going to be middle value but not super dark because I want my darkest values to be more in the middle ground there. And I'm going to splatter uh, some of the dark value paint into this and it's just going to create a little bit of texture and I want to cover up some of these other areas because I don't want to get splatter on those so I'm just going to lay a tissue over it but I'm just going to tap a loaded brush against my hand and, and just put a little pattern of, of some texture into this field just so you can get just a suggestion I don't have to, to render 10,000 little clumps of dirt so now if you look at this foreground, it's pretty much a middle value. There's no hard edges. They're, they're, the contrasts are very subtle. And it, it's not an area that's intended to be the focal point. But there are some suggestions in the direction of some of those light value changes that help guide you more towards the center of interest. I've dried this thoroughly, and I'm going to paint this rooftop and I want to have a nice clean edge on this and uh, I'm less likely to get that uh, painting freehand so I'm going to use uh, some tape here some of the uh, rice tape it's made by Nichiban and I'm going to mask around uh, this this rooftop the edges of it so that I can get nice clean crisp edges it's going to be a very dark valued wash that I'm putting down and I'm going to have some uh, nice variation of color in it so it, it's much easier for me to do that and, and charge it with color uh, having this tape around the edges you'll see that once I apply the paint how I apply it I'm going to begin to apply my paint this is a very dark value it's working with uh, royal blue and quinacridone and burnt orange. So um, I want to have some areas here where uh, I can pick up some of the brightness of the orange. So it, it's a little hard to see on camera, but I've got this very dark blue, and I'm, I'm just mixing in some of this burnt orange. And um, I can take it all the way to the edge very easily because I have that, that tape protecting it. I don't have to worry about my brush stroke going over a line while I mingle these two colors together in this area. So I've thoroughly dried this with a hair dryer and now I'm going to pick up the tape. I like to take the tip of a knife and just lift up the corner makes it easier to pull up and you can see as I remove this how it's left me nice clean edges. So this is a technique I use selectively when I want to maintain a nice clean edge. I'm going to paint the uh, the roof of the smaller building here. I don't have any tape here, um, but I'm not as concerned about the the edge uh, in the way that I was on that larger roof against the sky. So just putting that summer mixture down, but it's not as varied as the the larger rooftop.
Next, I'm going to take uh, some dark values. These are combinations of royal blue with some quinacridone burnt orange, some raw umber, and uh, I'm just going to start to paint uh, some of the dark shapes that uh, are spread out across this uh, farm complex. As I paint these areas, once again, I'll mention that uh, I'm not trying to identify specifically which, what each one of these little things uh, that I'm painting are. They're spread out over this, and this is a, a fairly uh, small area in the overall composition. Just the composition is set up that way with the big sky and the, 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 the large foreground and just very focused area of detail. Um, so it's a, it's a smaller area on the, in this painting. If this were a full sheet, maybe I'd be working in a little bit more detail. But I'm just trying to give the indication that there's some, some farm implements laying around, some barrels, some, some bales of hay. And I'm not necessarily trying to render any of them. I'm just identifying them as um, shapes of, of varying values. And, and I'll put in a few uh, touches of some color in some areas. There's a few barrels on the property that are kind of, kind of a reddish orange. And uh, there's a, the area I'm painting right now, there's a, a dark shadowed side, but then there's a, it's a, some type of a red farm implement. So that area that's white, I'm gonna put actually a, a bright red wash on, just to indicate that it's some type of farm, farm equipment. And I'm going to take that uh, red tone and I'm going to touch it on the barrels that I mentioned here. There's one that's a little bit farther out in the yard. And there's another one that's set back closer to the building. So that helps carry this, uh, this red tone uh, in, in a few places in the composition. It doesn't just isolate it in one spot. And there's a few areas uh, far off to the right where I'll actually put some of that also. I'm going to start to paint some of the shadowed area. This, this is a cast shadow. And to do it, I'm going to be working with cobalt blue, quinacridone rose matter. So I'll be using mixtures of blue, violet, blue, violet, red, violet, and uh, painting these areas that have a cast shadow on them. comes down the, the side of the silo in behind the, the smaller building. And then there's going to be a shadowed side of the, the larger uh, structure there. So there's uh, some area that's underneath the overhang of the roof that's a, a cast shadow. Then I'll also bring some of that in on the, the shadowed side of the building itself. And this is just a small flat wash that I'm putting down. Sometimes we don't think of these small areas as putting a wash down, but that's really what you're doing. Sometimes you're making like a brush mark and sometimes you're putting in a wash. And to me, there's a difference. That wash, you're leading up a small pool of water over an area or shape and um, kind of predetermined and then a brush mark you, is the result of just a, a steady brush stroke um, and it's the resulting mark that it makes in, 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 a, in a single brush stroke. I'm going to paint the shadowed side of the smaller building with the same mixture Now I'm going to do a little brush work and these are what I call more brush strokes. They're just, I put down a mark and I move on as opposed to leading a small pool of water over a, an over an area or a shape. These brush strokes are a bit more uh, calligraphy than they are uh, a wash. 
I'm going to take a mixture here of some raw sienna with just a little bit of Glenacrid and burnt orange in it. A little cerulean blue, not much. And I'm going to paint these uh, other silos here. They're, they're a, a very much a, a warm, neutral tone. This area that I'm working right now isn't going to have uh, the strong contrast that I have to the in the area to the left, which is more the center of interest or the focal point. This is a, a middle value that I'm putting down, a warm neutral. And I'll be putting down some other middle value tones here. And there'll be a little bit of uh, some light tones here, light values. But for the most part, it's going to be a low area of contrast because I really want to shift the focus more to the left there on that main building in this uh, line of, of buildings here. And, and keep in mind, too, um, that you want to in, involve, you want to be aware of the edge uh, of your composition. Even if it's a slight interaction, you, you want your design to carry to the edge. And uh, you don't want to have everything floating in space. In this case, this runs off the page. And I have to be careful there about creating a tangent because the edge of that building it could easily be perceived as being on the edge. However, I'm going to be putting in a wash over there to cover some of that up because there's a, a tree and a bush that comes in. So it won't look so much like a tangent, but I, I wouldn't want to leave it just like it is because that edge, pretty much the edge of the building is right at the edge of my tape and that would be kind of a, a bad design element. I'm going to put a gray wash over this other structure here. And this gray tone is made with a mixture of quinacrid and burnt orange with some uh, cobalt blue. And it's just a, a light middle value, pretty close in value to the silos that I have there. Um, but one is warm and one is cool. So you have a warm neutral and a cool neutral. Now I'm going to insert the reference photo again so you can see how this is developing. Now I'm going to start to work on those dark uh, evergreens that are uh, in between the, uh, the, the, the white, uh, bright white building and the, uh, the gray building to the right and the silos. So I'm starting with a light wash here. Um, there's not much more than dirty water, but it's um, has a little bit of a of a green tone, you know, and some uh, of the mixture has gr uh, sap green and uh, pyrrole red, so it, it helps neutralize it. Uh, but it's going to get much darker here, and I'm you can see that I'm keeping that top with a little bit more shape to it. So I'm bringing this tone down. So this this mixtures I'll be using. Are combinations of sap green, royal blue, quinacrid and burnt orange, some pyrrole red. So working with um, a cool side and a warm side of the color wheel and, and mixing those colors to help get some neutral, more natural colors. And so I have that light wash and, and now that area where I put that is wet. So now I'm going to start to drop in some darker um, valued mixture and um, while there's these are, are fairly rigid. I still want to have some soft edges um, involved in these shapes. So hopefully you can see how that tone I just put down has some softness to it. And that had a, quite a bit of burnt orange in it, but now I've come back with a, a mixture that has a little bit more sap green and royal blue. Very dark. So even within the shape I'm working in warm and cool colors. And that uh, that value comes from goes from the trees and down into some of the shadowed areas on the ground. So I treat that as one shape. I don't paint the tree and then paint the ground and paint any other areas where it's casting the shadow separately because I see them as one shape. And I'm going to try and have a little bit of variation within that shape and some texture. So as I fill in these shapes, Part of what I'm doing here and trying to describe uh, these are trees, obviously. Um, well, I say I, I view them as shapes. I view them as shapes, but I know that they are trees and there's certain features that I want to highlight. So, uh, 
a part of the technique that I use to describe these trees is a wash, and then part of it's going to be more calligraphic. I'm just using a uh, number four round. This is a synthetic sable from Princeton Brush. It's their Aqua Elite Series. It has a nice point and holds quite a bit of paint. And you can see now that that's a very dark shape against that lighter um, building structure there. So I have a nice strong uh, value contrast. And there's the top of a, some trees back here that are behind the silos in that building. So I'm going to give an indication of those right there. While I'm working with that dark value, I'm going to take some of it and work it into a few other places in the composition. So still just using a round brush. And I'm going to give some touches here just to suggest some edges uh, on some of these areas. And there's uh, just some things laying around on, uh, in the yard here or whatever this area is in front of these buildings and, and beside them. So I'm going to work in some more of this dark value. It helps balance the composition out a little bit. I'm going to put a few touches right along the edge of this green area here just so you can tell that you're making a transition from that plowed field into the to the the grassy area. There's going to be an edge there. These tree shapes are still wet so I'm going to scrape a little bit into them to give some texture and and modulate the value a little bit. The, this will lighten the tone in a few areas and it'll give the suggestion of some some of these branches being out front so they're not so flat. I need to give an indication of some of the features on these buildings, some of these windows, so I'm going to put in a fairly dark value there. It's not quite as dark as the trees, but it's still pretty dark. There's a few more of these on the side here. So just give an indication of those. And then I'm going to um, put that same value on the side of the, uh, the, the barn. There's a small window or a box or something up there on the side of that so I'm going to use the same value and give an indication of that up there. Now I'm going to uh, put a, a small area of water on top of this building structure here. This is where I said I was going to bring in some tree shapes so this didn't look so much like a tangent, but that's how I intended to paint it from the start. So now I'm working in some of the quinacridone and burnt orange, and I'll bring in some a little bit of royal blue into the mixture, and just give the indication of these these shrubs and and tree shapes that are over here. And once I dry this, I'll come back in and put some branches over top of it. Now I'm going to take the same mixture that I was just using and I'm going to paint the edge of this silo. It has kind of a, a rusty tone to it. And there's some different elements to this silo um, that contour it. Some rings and there's some horizontal or some vertical lines in it. So I'm just going to just give just a little indication. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to just put a bunch of solid rings around this thing. So I just touch my brush here and there, but try, still trying to contour the cylindrical shape of the silo. And I'm going to do a bit more brush work. Just to indicate some of the, the, sh the shingles on the roof there or the panels, whichever's on there. It's hard to tell from the distance. And do a little bit more brushwork on these silos. There's a, 
there's an element that comes off the side of that. So I want to give an indication of the separation of those two components of the silo. A bit of a dark mixture here in this shadowed area. A little darker there. Clear that up. Clear that that edge up a little bit, or clean it up. And um, I'm going to take some water and bring that up. Just gradate that up a little bit, just to to show that that's in a deeper shadow than some of the areas higher up on that silo. I want to deepen the shadow on the side of the, the, the large barn there and I'm using the same mixtures that I was using earlier, the combinations of cobalt blue with quinacrin and rose matter to give some violet, blue violet and just blue tones. And I don't want that just to be a flat wash on the side. I want a few areas to seem a little lighter and some gradation. So I've added some water here and there and I put in some more pigment here and there. So sometimes people are always saying, are you working wet and wet or wet on dry? Which way do you work? I go back and forth and as the painting evolved, you do a little of each. Here when I first put this wash down, I was working wet on dry, but as I put more pigment into it, I'm working wet on wet, even though it's a small area. I've, I've done both. I want to throw a little more shadow on these silos so they have a little bit more dimension to them. They're not just flat. So I'm coming in with a darker tone here. Yeah, throughout the, this uh, video, I've mentioned several times the colors I'm using, and they're the same colors that I had in that list. And, and sometimes I'll just say it's a dark tone, but it's it's the same dark tone I've been putting in over and over and over. So sometimes I don't always say the colors; I'll say a dark tone because I've already used it four, five, six times throughout the whole composition, throughout the whole painting. There's some darker elements that are in front of this uh, tree line, which is a, a very soft edge and, and has a, a distance feel to it. There's some elements that are closer to the, the middle ground here, so I'm going to indicate those with a dark value. I'm going to break those up a little bit. Just put a, a few more touches on the edge of that lawn. Now I'm going to put in uh, some of these tree trunks and limbs that are uh, overlapping that, that distant tree line. So these are closer than what's going on in the distance and these are tied to uh, some of these soft washes that I put up a little bit higher than the tree line just to give the indication of, of the, uh, the branches that kind of form a, a hazy shape up there. So now I'm going to uh, help qualify what those are up there floating around that they're they're part of these trees so I'm taking a liner brush this is a number one liner brush it's a nylon brush and I'm just giving a slight indication of the trees being there I'm not trying to paint every branch I see in the picture but just give a suggestion of some of these trees and I don't want these trees to be the focus so I'm trying to keep them fairly much a middle value I want them to take a bit of a back seat to some of these other areas of, of a, that have stronger contrast. These are some of the things you have to think about early on before you begin your painting process uh, that you know that you're going to have this distant tree line, you're going to want some soft edges, you're going to have these overlapping shapes that are a little more defined, a little hard edged and it'd be very difficult to do this uh, what I call paint by number style. You wouldn't, wouldn't paint the tree and then paint the areas in between and, and get that nice soft continuous tree line going behind it. It's, this is better approached by layering. There's times when that, that, that kind of a process, the, the paint by number kind of works, but not when you're trying to get this type of an effect. Um, you want to have a combination of the soft edges, the hard edges, lost and found edges, and overlapping shapes, and, and layering and building up your painting this way is a good way to approach it. So there's a, a tree 
it's a little further down in front of the tree line here. So I'll give an indication of that. Again, I don't try and overdo it with the, with the branches. I put just enough to give a suggestion uh, of the tree that's there. And there's a small tree that's actually right in front of the the, the main building here. So I'm going to give an indication of that. It'll be, it'll be a little bit more contrast with this tree because it's going right over top of the pure white of the paper. So I don't, I don't want to overdo it. I just want to show there's a, a small tree there. Next, there's some branches that are coming in from the side. Uh, there, there's a, a lot more curve to it, which works well here because, it, again, that's another uh, uh, element of direction which can help lead the eye towards the main barn there where I really want to be the focal point. So there's some, there's some vertical trees there, but there's some, some branches that, that arc and come over and can help lead the eye that way. Now I'm going to take a flat brush and I'm going to give an indication of uh, more branches and some of the bulk that, that gets up there in the trees. So this is a low moisture brush. I've taken it to a cloth to remove a lot of the moisture and it just creates a more of a pattern of texture when you make your brush stroke. And I don't want to overdo it, I just want to give enough to give an indication that there's a lot of branches up there. I'm going to do the same here to the left here, just, just a little few brush strokes here to carry that activity down the tree line. There's a few trees uh, that are closer to us in front of this tree line, so I want them to, to be a little stronger value. And I want to, to put a, a darker value right beside uh, this this white barn so I've put a piece of the rice tape down to keep a nice clean edge there and um, I'm coming in with a nice dark value here very similar to what I used in the trees has a little bit more blue in it and I'm going to give an indication of some trees here and I'm going to uh, bring it down the tree line just a little bit hopefully you can see as this gets uh, this dark value gets put in there, it starts to to help make that barn really stand out more. That white gets um, even brighter because it's positioned next to that nice dark value. And I've kept that nice clean edge. I don't want it to be jagged or irregular or look like I I painted it in there with a irregular brush stroke. So that's why I used a little piece of tape there. Now I'm going to take the scraping tool here and I'm going to make a few marks in this just as I did in the other trees. That's another thing because I have that tape there I can take the scraping right to the edge of the barn without losing the edge. I'm going to continue that down uh, a little bit more. I'm going to put a, there's some some briar bushes or something that are uh, not too far away from this building moving down in front of the tree line and I want to have some of that uh, conacrid and orange tone in there, that kind of a rust tone. So I'm going to take some of that uh, and I'm going to put a few areas of that with a, a very fluid mixture but still rich in pigment and I'm going to take my uh, first my brush with some clear water and I'm going to soften those edges and then I'm going to come in with a spray bottle so I'm going to start to lead some of that paint away with my brush and I'm going to spray it with a fine mist spray to really soften that up a little bit. I want to pick up the extra moisture because it's going to run because the gravity is now kind of coming against where I want it to go. But you can see how that creates that um, 
a darker kind of a shadowy shape that's it you can tell it's closer than those distant trees but it's still uh, it's not trying to be the star of the show it's not competing with what's going on in that that uh, center of interest put a few more touches of color in there it's hard to see but I'm putting a little bit of a, the, also the blue and then I'll come back with some of the quinacridone and burnt orange put a few, few more touches of that and then I'm going to remove the piece of tape that I put down to, to uh, protect that edge and you can see how it gave me a nice clean edge I've thoroughly dried this and now I'm going to put a white mat on it to get rid of the tape and the board and there you have my painting a good place to be I hope you enjoyed this video please stay safe